The Mark. 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 Part 15. The Consummation of the Age. In the esoteric teaching in the Gospels, many references to the second coming of the Son of Man are found. To understand what they mean, it's necessary to realize one of the fundamental ideas of esoteric psychology in reference to the human race on earth. A particular form of esoteric teaching given at a certain moment in time, that is, historically speaking, lasts only for a limited period. Its force and its meaning gradually begin to die. In the case of the teaching of Messiah, which gave meaning and force to many developments in human life, we notice that Messiah didn't say that this teaching would last forever. He gave a very clear indication that it could only last for a certain time. In this connection, he speaks of what will happen, what signs will occur, when the force, the impulse that was given by his strength begins to wane in the world. He warns his disciples that a time will come when truth is exhausted, and then speaks about the sign of the second coming of the Son of Man. His disciples ask him, what shall be the sign of the second coming of the Son of Man? Disciples came unto Yahshua, saying, Tell us when those things shall be, and what is the sign of thy coming, and of the consummation of the age, I own. And Yahshua answering said to them, See that no one lead you astray. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Messiah, and shall lead many astray. But ye shall hear of wars, and rumors of wars. See that ye be not disturbed, for all these things must needs be, but the end is not yet. For nation shall be stirred up against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes. But all these things are the beginning of sorrows. Matthew 26, 3-9. The phrase, consummation of the age, is sometimes translated as end of the world. For this reason, many susceptible people think that a time will come when the visible world will be destroyed. However, in the Greek, he suntelia, to ionos, the meaning is quite different, and it has nothing to do with the visible world. We rather have to think of the meaning as referring to the end of a period period of time, Ionos, Eon, Age. We have to think of the meaning as referring to the end of a period of culture, the end of a phase of humanity, and the beginning of an increasing confusion in which literally nation may rise against nation and so on. But the psychological meaning refers to something quite different. In many of the esoteric books of the Old Testament, which have a meaning quite apart from the literal sense, the idea that truth may fail on the earth is frequently found. When a nation or a people lose their fundamental and traditional values and no longer have any background, they can be compared with an earthquake. Now, when esoteric truth fails, when man becomes entirely sensual, a creature of the senses, and believes nothing else but the evidence of the senses, when all meaning has been destroyed apart from physical meaning, he inevitably begins to degenerate and pass into increasing violence because he has no inner direction and no inner values, which have always been created in him by one form or another of esoteric teaching. Esoteric teaching always gives values beyond physical life, and it is only through these values that any culture can be formed. When all inner values break up, then there's no truth to govern a man more internally, so that he realizes he cannot do certain things owing to a sense of inner integrity. Then the end of the world begins. The whole force of inner development begins to die. The whole idea that man is on this earth to learn something, the whole possibility of inner development ceases. And when this is widespread, it is the consummation of the age. The force brought into the world away back in time is exhausted. 
But we have to notice that when this happens, a second coming is at hand. From Matthew 24, we can see that man regarded psychologically from the standpoint of higher and esoteric teaching must be given truth to lift him from the level of violence, self-interest, and appetite. And when this truth, by its passage through generation after generation, becomes completely distorted, a period of confusion follows, which leads to a second manifestation of the truth, represented as the second coming of the Son of Man. People imagine that truth will always maintain itself, but all truth wears itself out and a new form of the same truth must be sown on humanity. Every nation, every race has been given truth. It's always the same truth, but given in different forms, sometimes with the emphasis more on one side or more on another side, according to the conditions of the time. But when truth of this kind breaks up and it loses all its guiding force, When it has lost all its effective power, there is a consummation of the age followed by a period of confusion which heralds the coming of another form of the same truth. With this brief description, we can perhaps realize that the consummation of the age does not mean the end of the world, but the end of one manifestation of the truth, and also that it will be inevitably followed by a new manifestation of truth, which of course may take centuries to come into force. It's a cycle that recurs, so we can understand that the Son of Man will come again, for this means the renewal of esoteric teaching on the earth. The force is given and gradually dies away in time. The period of chaos follows. The force once more comes down again. Each manifestation is called in the esoteaching of Messiah the second coming of the Son of Man, of some being taking on the level of humanity, raising himself up through his own overcoming of all human temptations, and once more reestablishing order, and so again opening the way for human development. The higher level is then once more open to the lower level, and the purpose of man's original creation to pass from a lower to a higher level of being and understanding is once more made possible. What then is this truth that is sown into the world at definite intervals to lift man beyond his senses? Is it merely a question of arbitrary, literal commandments? We can notice that Messiah began his teaching not with any literal commandments, but with a psychological idea. The idea of metanoia, which means change of mind. Esoteric teaching begins with the idea that change of mind is the first thing. This word, metanoia, awkwardly translated as repentance, means a new way of thinking about the meaning of one's own life. Esoteric teaching is to make us think differently. That is its starting point. To feel the mystery of one's own existence, of how one thinks and feels and moves, and to feel the mystery of consciousness, and to feel the mystery of the minute organization of matter. All this can begin to affect metanoia in a man. The contrary is to feel that everything is attributable to oneself. The one feeling opens the mind to its higher range of possibilities, and the other feeling closes the mind and turns us downward through our senses. War in heaven. Things do not remain the same. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Isaiah 42, 9. But apparently, it's not only conditions on earth that change, but in heaven also. There shall be a new heaven and a new earth. Revelation 21, 1. Moreover, it's indicated that those in heaven do not necessarily remain there when a new heaven is created. We read of there being war in heaven, of Michael and his angels fighting with the dragon and his angels, Revelation 12, 7. The dragon and his angels were cast out of heaven, neither was their place found any more in heaven. 
They seem to represent all those who externally are moral and pious, but inwardly have no belief. Messiah laid great stress on the necessity for inner belief and the uselessness of outer religion only. It would appear that the outer practice of religion may be rewarded by a sojourn in some kind of heaven which comes to an end, as in their life on earth these people who inwardly believe nothing but are externally rigid, literal, and forbidding are compared to dragons. There is nothing of grace about the dragon face. Peter says, we look for new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. 2 Peter 3.13. It's clear that self-righteousness, which comes from pride, is not meant, for it has no connection with righteousness, which springs from inner goodness. Messiah said some things about the changing nature of the kingdom of heaven, speaking of John the Baptist after saying, Among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. He goes on to say, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth of violence, and the violent take it by force. Matthew 11, 12. What can this strange remark mean? It can only mean that the conditions of entry into the kingdom of heaven change. From the time that John the Baptist began to preach to the beginning of Messiah's teaching, there was a period where the violent take it by force. Does this mean that those who did violence to themselves gain the kingdom, or has it an entirely different meaning? The conditions of entry into the kingdom of heaven and the frequent mention of a covenant being made between Elohim and man are connected. A covenant is an agreement made between two persons to the effect that if one of them fulfills certain conditions, the other will do what he promised. It is not permanent, as the phrase covenant of the age shows. The Hebrew word olam, translated often in the Old Testament as everlasting, really means age-lasting, lasting for an aeon, as in the passage in Jeremiah 32, 40. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good. In a developing humanity which is being raised from a state of relative barbarism, it would not be expected to be permanent. The Ten Commandments given to the Israelites on Mount Sinai were a covenant between Elohim and Israel. If the Israelites obeyed them, Elohim would prosper them. If ye walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, I will have respect unto you, and make you fruitful, and multiply you, and a establish my covenant with you. And if ye shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but that ye break my covenant, I will destroy your high places, and cut down your images, and cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols, and my soul shall abhor you. Leviticus 26, 3, 9, 15, and 30. The command are about what was to be done and about what must not be done. That was the mark to aim at. Consider the first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And the last, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Exodus 20, 3 and 17. Are these possible to carry out? It has often been said that what a man loves most is really his God. A man may, of course, imagine he loves Elohim before everything. In that case, he doesn't notice himself. Although self-love is a giant power, it's not easy to observe even a fraction of it. When it peeps out unmistakably, we justify ourselves at once. Again, who can say that he is aware of all his forms of covetousness and that they have no power over him? If he says so, does he observe himself enough? 
Sin means to miss the mark. In the New Testament, the word translated as sin is taken from aiming an arrow at a mark and missing it. In the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments were the mark, that is, the law, the Torah. Messiah said he brought a new law, love one another. He speaks of a certain kind of love, conscious love, and not of emotional love, which changes so easily into its opposite. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. John 13, 34. Messiah speaks in a parable of the end of the age. He uses the word aeon, which refers to a period during which certain possibilities and conditions exist. With the coming of Messiah, one of these periods begin, and with it certain conditions for entry into the kingdom of heaven. Those who follow Followed the teachings of Messiah sincerely from their hearts, and not merely externally, could gain the kingdom of heaven. The parable, which is usually called the parable of the tares and the wheat, is as follows. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy has done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Matthew thirteen twenty four and following. Messiah explains that this parable is about the end of the aeon, not world, as it is translated. He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in in the end of this aeon, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Matthew thirteen thirty seven and following. This explanation of the parable refers to the termination of a period of conscious selection. In each age, there is the idea of selection, not blind, but intelligent. Each age or period appears to bring about a different kind of selection. In one short parable, Messiah compares the kingdom of heaven in general to fishermen using a net to catch fish. When they had got sufficient, they selected the good and threw the useless away. Way. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which, when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. Matthew thirteen forty seven and following. The New Will Someone pushes me up a grass slope. There's a ditch. It's not wide, but difficult to cross. The difficult to cross ditch at the top of the slope is full of the bones of prehistoric animals, the remains of violent things, of beasts of prey, of monsters, of snakes. They go far down into this abyss. There is a plank to cross by, but the air seems full of restraining power, like the invisible influence of some powerful magnet. And this, with the fear of crossing this depth, although the width is not great, holds me back. I cannot say for how long, for there is no ordinary time in this. 
Then I find myself across on the other side. What wonderful vision do I now behold? I see someone teaching or drilling some recruits. That is all. At first sight, there seems nothing marvelous. He smiles. He indicates somehow that he doesn't necessarily expect to get any results from what he is doing. He doesn't seem to mind. He doesn't show any signs of impatience when they are rude to him. The lesson is nearly over, but this will not make any difference to him. It is as if he said, well, this has to be done. One cannot expect much. One must give them help, though they don't want it. It is his invulnerableness that strikes me. He is not hurt or angered by their snares or lack of discipline. He has some curious power, but hardly uses it. I pass on marveling that he could do it. I couldn't take on such a thankless task. Eventually, I come to a place, perhaps a shop, where boats are stored. Beyond is the sea. When I wake, I think of this man. To do what he is doing is so utterly contrary to anything I would do. I would need a new will to do it. It would mean I would have to go in a direction I never went in. I thought much about this direction. How could I define it for myself? I would have been violent to those recruits. Yes, that was it. He showed no violence. He had not a will of violence. He seemed purified from all violence. That was the secret. That was the source of the curious power I detected in him. A man without violence. And then I reflected that to reach him, I had to get across to the other side of the deep gulf full of the bones of prehistoric beasts, full of the remains of violent creatures. This had been done for me somehow, and I found myself in the border of another country, at the edge of it only, but beyond the prehistoric beasts. Here this nonviolent man lived and taught. It was the country of the nonviolent, where recruits were being taught. They seemed an indifferent lot, but perhaps they represented people who could learn something eventually. He had nearly finished his lesson. Beyond was the sea, and there were boats stored near it. No doubt, when he had finished the course, he was going on somewhere, beyond the land. As for me, I have been given only a glance into the meaning of the new will, a will not based on violence or on having your own way. I repeat, only a glance, for I knew I had not, save in spirit, really crossed that deep gulf yet, filled with the bones of the violent past, and left it behind, finally. There were no recruits for me, or were those recruits different eyes in myself that I was trying to teach? Certainly none of the waiting boats was mine, but from this glance I know more practically what going in a new direction is, and what a new will purified from violence means. I know also that the possibilities of following this new will and new direction lie in every moment of one's life, and that I continually forget. End of part 15